Thank you. Uh, Judge Kane, when uh, we were talking before lunch, uh, we were talking about your practices with uh, juries uh, that are, are fairly unique and hopefully will get exported. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a there is contemporary debate about uh, what is referred to as the vanishing jury trial, um, and it's not, it's not so much a debate as it is a recognition of the obvious. <laughs> I think. What what is the obvious, and uh, well, the, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, prescriptions, if any? Jury trials have uh, gone down to in civil cases less than two percent of cases filed and in criminal cases, uh, even less than that. Uh, and you have to separate the uh, demise of the civil jury trial from the uh, exsanguination of the criminal jury trial. But I, I will try to do that. Uh, I, I have to point out, I don't know the judge's name, but uh, I read in one of these legal newsletters of a federal judge who uh, was in the state of Washington attending some gathering and he said that uh, uh, he, he had tried different things to try and have more jury trials but he just didn't understand why uh, we were not having them and uh, I, I felt like writing him but I didn't uh, I didn't calm down enough I mean it seems to me to be fairly obvious why civil jury trials are no longer held. Uh, the first thing is not the most important, but uh, for a great many years, when Congress would pass a statute, uh, whatever kind of uh, statute it might be relating to uh, uh, private causes of action, uh, the Rehabilitation Act being one of them, and uh, Title VII, another, but uh, they would always put in there that that the uh, parties could have a jury trial. The right to jury trial in a statutorily uh, created cause of action would obtain. And recent legislation does not have that language in it. So uh, the courts have, uh, by implication uh, or by inference, have uh, said since it's not specifically uh, mentioned that in some instances there is no right to a jury trial. I think that's wrong, but that's nevertheless what some courts have done. But that's just a minor uh, point. The major point is this. The federal rules of civil procedure uh, were worked on for a period of about five to six years in the 1930s. And they had uh, uh, a blue ribbon uh, committee of experts, uh, practicing lawyers, law professors, and federal judges uh, with, with all the kind of assistance they might need from other disciplines to come up with a new set of uh, rules of civil procedure. The historic background is very, very important and critical uh, because we had gone from common law pleadings that were so uh, strict that if you pled the wrong form of action with the wrong Latin uh, adjective or verb involved in it, your case was dismissed. It was ultra uh, formalism. And that uh, was changed in the United States by states coming up with their own rules of civil procedure and modifying them by statute. And we had the federal courts who would apply the rules of civil procedure in the state in which the federal court was located. So if uh, in those days there would be 36 states, you would have 36 different kinds of procedure. Uh, the states would modify their procedure, but the federal courts would keep what it was they had when they adopted it. So that became even more uh, bewildering and chaotic, and federal practice became uh, a, a genuine specialty where lawyers had to learn these uh, arcane uh, rules of procedure in the specific district in which they were located in order to, uh, uh, to practice. And most lawyers uh, practicing in the state courts 
had neither the time nor the, uh, the clients to do that. So uh, there, there was a great deal of, uh, in, in the 19th century, a great deal of uh, 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 concern and activity to try and reform the rules of civil procedure. And we had uh, one thing called the field code. And the field code was a, a the, the brother of a Supreme Court justice who drafted a code for New York and it was adopted in most states. And this was a code of procedure that provided a specific uh, way of pleading a specific kind of case. So it was similar to the common law pleading, but it wasn't as stringent or as formal as the common law pleading and they couldn't have amendments to it. But again, each state was changing it as they went along and the federal courts were changing sometimes and sometimes not. And uh, so by uh, the, the turn of the century into the 1900s, uh, when uh, uh, Dean Roscoe Pound uh, delivered an address to the convention of the American uh, Bar Association, and talked about the utter chaos that was there and the failings and why the public did not support the courts. And uh, also uh, existing at that time was a distinction between actions at law, which provide for damages, uh, money damages, and actions in equity. And they had different rules for equity, different rules for uh, actions at law, and in some states, uh, the uh, state of Delaware still has the, uh, the remnants of that, but in some states had courts of chancery that handled equity and courts of law, and they merged law and equity in the, into the courts, but the judges had to use separate rules for them. And in equitable, equitable proceedings, you are not entitled to a jury, so uh, only in actions at law. The uh, uh, firm firmament was such that this need for reform went on and on until uh, the 1930s when this committee was organized. And as you would expect from lawyers, judges, and uh, law school professors, they looked at the history that I've just given you to correct the historical problems. There wasn't a single one of them that looked at the future. And I, I happen to have been masochistic enough to have read their proceedings, so I, I know about this uh, very well. This is the history of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure? Uh, that, that came out, and they, they were uh, published in 1937 and became effective and uh, uh, were applied in 1938, which is 81 years ago, I happen to know. So, uh, at any rate, there was no, no reference at all even though at the time uh, television existed in the experimental stage, uh, jet engines were being uh, toyed with prior to World War II. Uh, uh, airlines were starting commercial travel. The uh, telegraph had been replaced by uh, long distance uh, uh, telephones to a great extent. Uh, but there was no xerography. Uh, there were no computers, and yet anyone that would have talked to uh, an MIT professor of engineering would have received an answer, yeah, these things were all being worked at. This is what the future is going to hold. Well, they, this committee didn't do that. They made no reference at all. So uh, why are we having a, uh, a decrease, an alarming decrease in jury trials? Well, for one thing, the rules of civil procedure, as they exist now, even with minor amendments to them, are essentially a Conestoga wagon on the information highway. It has created a, a, a situation in which civil litigation is literally too expensive to pursue. Lawyers are obligated, instead of, uh, as an example, 40 years ago, when I tried to a personal injury case here, uh, it would be tried in three or four days and we might have as many as 50 exhibits. 
a personal injury case today has a thousand exhibits and takes two to three weeks to try. Uh, in those days, an expert witness would be called in and he would look at the x-rays and show them to the jury uh, and give a diagnosis and how he treated somebody. And you'd have one physician there and perhaps one or two on the defense. Today, you have a, a radiologist, uh, you have a, a diagnostician, you might have a hospitalist, a, a specialty which didn't even exist in those days. You've got the uh, primary care physician and then you have one or two others. That, that those are just for the plaintiff. And all these experts come in and the, the shift has been because of technology, which our system doesn't absorb. The same thing is true with because of the computer uh, and the internet, is that we now have uh, gigabytes and tetrabytes of data that are available. And lawyers are still under an obligation to do due, due diligence and to sift through and find all of uh, this, this data. Uh, we have not created a system of procedure that accommodates this glut of information. And so what we've done is create a situation in which using these antiquated methods that we have uh, makes it too expensive to try cases and as a consequence, cases are settling. And we, we used to have a distinction between uh, office lawyers and trial lawyers. We now have uh, transactional lawyers, general practitioners, litigators, and trial lawyers. And the, the, there are lawyers now who never go to court who are litigators. They spend all their time in discovery and retrieving this information and coming up with uh, so much data that nobody can really absorb it. So that, that's the principal reason why we're having a decrease in, uh, in civil jury trials. I think the other is that there's been a, a de-emphasis on it because we have allowed uh, a great deal of secrecy in our courts. The courts are no longer totally public institutions. Lawyers file things under seal. Conf settlements are made confidentially and judges are uh, participating in that process. I don't, but some do. And they will have a confidential settlement, which nobody knows what the settlement was. That's because to a great extent, corporations are concerned not so much about the money as they are about the moral judgment uh, that takes place with a jury verdict and the significant increase in the probability that stockholders can sue for mismanagement. So they, they like to keep these things secret. They don't like to have uh, public judgments. And the next thing is, is that largely because of uh, the changes in technology, we don't have daily newspapers anymore. Denver used to have three uh, daily newspapers, the Denver Post, the Rocky Mountain News, and Survey's Journal. Uh, and people, we used to have uh, when I became a judge 41 years ago, the Denver Post had two full-time uh, reporters covering the federal courts. The Rocky Mountain News had two and sometimes three, and Service Journal had one who covered. And then in addition, the reporters who were assigned to the business pages of those papers also had reporters that would cover uh, commercial cases and come over. Do you know how many we have today? None. There isn't a single assigned reporter to report in the daily press what goes on here. And of course, the, the soft media, TV, they, they only show up when they can put their cameras up and photograph somebody, and it's not journalism. They don't cover what's going on. So uh, that, that's led to an isolation of the court system from the public, and it has led to considerable public indifference about what happens in the courts. Uh, a friend of mine who is a reporter told me that today he covers uh, the assignments that uh, years ago five reporters handled. And he says, all I can do is stay at my computer, and he says, and receive press releases from PR agents 
and take their information and report it as news. That, so we've lost journalism, we've lost a public interest in it, and people don't pay that much attention to it. Law firms now engage, for the most part, in settlement of cases, not on the basis of what, what's right and wrong, but of how much it costs. And, and that, that has caused a, a, a diminishment. If we wanted to have a public uh, system, what we would do is to, to have a new blue ribbon committee that was comprised of some engineers, some computer specialists, some linguists, as well as some lawyers and law professors and judges, and we would throw out our entire rules of civil procedure and come out with brand new ones that, that are designed to handle uh, this kind of a, a, of a uh, glut of, of data, but we don't have that now. And that's what I think is the reason for the failure. I have had things happen in this court that, uh, that really just shatter my imagination. I, I had a lawyer in a, a very, very uh, extensive, uh, expensive case who uh, a witness was called to the stand and he said an objection and he said, I haven't taken his deposition. And I said, have you ever tried a drunk driving case? <laughs> we get along quite well without, but he said that he felt his client had a constitutional right in a civil case for the lawyer to have deposed anyone who was going to testify. And he actually argued that. I overruled it and it didn't go up on appeal, but that's just one of the instances to show you the dependence that we've had on all these gadgets and uh, collecting information without analyzing it. Well, what, have, what have we lost as, as a uh, legal system, uh, as a, really as a country, because we have so few jury trials. What we've lost is government, a third of the Gettysburg Address. We have lost government by the people. We have government of the people and allegedly government for the people. It's more government for the lobbyists, but government by the people, the, the, the biggest instance, incident of government by the people is people sitting on a jury and rendering a moral as well as legal judgment. And we don't do that. It's, it's practically non-existent. And in, uh, I'm sad to say, but I think in my lifetime we just won't have any jury trials. Yeah, the other thing that we've had, which is, uh, again, the Supreme Court says it's wonderful and it's, uh, uh, I, I have the feeling that sometimes the Supreme Court decides a case it reminds me of a guy I knew who had an extraordinarily ugly sister that he tried to fix up with dates all the time. And the Supreme Court comes out with some really ugly decisions on occasion that we have to live with. And the decisions on arbitration and alternative dispute resolution have ruined our system. Even aside from everything else I've said, if you have mandatory arbitration by contract, and what that means is that you have somebody uh, in a uh, hourly wage with no formal education and maybe English as a second language, and they sign a contract drafted by lawyers uh, for a company, and it, in it includes some small print that says that any dispute has to be handled by, uh, by arbitration, and the Supreme Court says that's fine. Conscionability has been removed from it freedom of contract, the illusion of, there's no freedom there, but that's what they say. So we have arbitrators, we have privatized uh, the litigation process, and uh, it was sold to the public, uh, it'd be cheaper and faster. Arbitration is more expensive than going to court now. You have to hire three arbitrators according to the rules of the American Arbitration Association. It's created a, a job opportunity for uh, judges to re retire or resign from the bench and go into the rent-a-judge business. And uh, all of their decisions are private. That's the, that's the essential wrong with it. They're all, so the public has no idea.
unless you subscribe, for example, unless you subscribe to some service and pay a, a good sum for it as a personal injury lawyer, you have, if you were just a person on the street and you your car was hit and you have a ruptured cervical disc, you have no idea what that is worth. None. That's because we don't have newspapers and we don't have jury verdicts announced and we don't have the jury trials making those verdicts. We do have lawyers on billboards. We have lawyers on billboards and that's another matter that uh, you haven't asked but I'd be happy to uh, uh, elocute on that for quite some time with the utter disaster of lawyer advertising. But uh, to go back to your original question on uh, criminal law, you can look at the sentencing guidelines as to why we don't have criminal cases anymore. Sentencing without the guidelines is the province and function of an independent judge appointed for life who can, without fear, favor, risk of loss of employment, etc., can make a decision in a case, can make rulings in cases, and can sentence people. But what has happened is that we had the mandatory guidelines and that for that period of time, 14 years or so, has created an entire uh, generation of judges from 1987 forward who never sentenced people without the guidelines. So even though now they're advisory, they're still used by, by these judges. And the guidelines were formulated and developed with the intense effort of the Department of Justice. So the prosecution has, in effect, taken control of sentencing and put it over in the Department of Justice rather than in front of an independent judge. And prosecutors make charging decisions that judges are not allowed to uh, interfere with, and they will routinely charge five or six separate violations and then the defense comes in and they have to bargain and plea bargaining rather than trial has, uh, has, has taken place so that plea bargaining has replaced the jury trial statistically. And so what happens then is that the defense attorney looks at it and he looks at the guidelines and he says the judge is probably going to give you this. If you plead guilty and it's even in the law under the the shibboleth of, of saying acceptance of responsibility, uh, that, that's written into the statute by the Justice Department. And what it means is, if, if I inform on my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, uh, my wife, then I've accepted responsibility. I've cooperated, and therefore I get less of a sentence than anybody else does. So you've destroyed whatever integrity the person had in order to get them to cooperate, and then you give them the benefit of less sentence when what you've done is damage them for the rest of their life. There are a lot of judges who take the position that uh, if you go to trial, you have automatically not accepted responsibility. Yes. And therefore, you, you are penalized at least three points or 18 to 24 months under the guidelines. I think, I think and I have said this, uh, and I say it in every single case I have, that that's reprehensible. That's what's called uh, in the, uh, the back halls of justice, uh, it's, it's called the trial tax. And uh, the prisons are filled with people that will tell other prisoners that if you go to trial, the judge is gonna give you a heavier sentence than if you plead guilty. And I, in every single case I have, I advise, and I will not advise just the lawyer, I require the defendant to be present before once the, the defendant appears in front of the magistrate and they set bond and they make sure that he has a lawyer and he receives his preliminary Miranda warnings, I have a hearing right after that. And they come up to my courtroom and I talk to the defendant directly and personally. And I tell them about the trial tax and I tell them you're gonna hear about it in custody and the people that are talking to you you have to ask yourself the first question, if they're so smart, why are they in prison? 
And I said, the second thing you have to understand is that what they say is true with a lot of judges, but it has never been true with me and it never will. I think acceptance of responsibility, an accurate analysis, is that the person accepts responsibility who requires the government to prove its case. That makes our system vibrant. That's responsibility, that's civic awareness, to require somebody to come in and prove it. And if they don't, the person goes free, and if they're convicted, they should be punished the same for the offense and not for what the assertion of their rights. I feel extremely strongly about that. You, you've written uh, several articles about sentencing. Uh, yes. And, and one in particular, fairly recently called Robitis, R-O-B-E-T-I-S, uh, where, where you explain uh, how your sentencing practices evolved and yeah. a couple of painful lessons you learned along the way. Well, that, could that could was, you expound on that a little sure. bit? Sure. That was the most uh, humiliating uh, experience that, that I've ever had as a judge and certainly ranks up there with any others I can't even remember right now. It's the most shameful things I've ever done in my life. Uh, I have to give a little bit of background for that. But Denver, Colorado is a, a large metropolitan area that attracts a great many young people from eastern Colorado, western Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, uh, and some from elsewhere, but they're from small towns and they, they come here, quite a few of them, uh, to get jobs. And they uh, will, will go to a uh, secretarial school or some kind of a technical school and get some sort of training where they can get a, get a job. And uh, they then will join together because our rents are so high and you'll see a, a two bedroom apartment that will have as many as, as six young people living in it, sharing the rent. So uh, that, that's a background. The other uh, background is that when I started practicing law and clear until uh, till this particular event, uh, I had learned that uh, when I had a client and the judge was going to grant probation, the judge would give a Sunday school lecture from the bench and just rant and rave and tell this person how bad they've been and how they've humiliated their family and all the bad things they've done and then say something like, well, I'm going to place you on probation, but don't you ever come back into this courtroom again. And they would scare the hell out of them and then put them on probation. And the same judge, if he was sentencing somebody to prison, would just say, now I've read the whole report five years or whatever it might be, that's the sentence, and they wouldn't say anything more. So I, I picked that up, and uh, I had a case, a young girl from uh, western Nebraska, and she came to Denver, and she went to a, uh, some kind of a, a school, and she learned to become a bank teller, and she got a job with one of the big banks in Denver, and they give them a polyester blazer and tell them that they're professional and uh, they're on probation. And then they meet other young people and they get an apartment and they're all starting off on their lives at, at age 19, 20 years old, maybe 21. And uh, so after they work as probationers in these large companies, including the banks, uh, and, but the bank in this case is what happened, uh, they get a notice, you've successfully completed your uh, probation, you are now a, a, a professional working in this bank, and uh, then a, another pay period so on goes by, and they say, because you are uh, a, a valued employee of the bank, we have a very special relationship with one of our depositors, the so-and-so auto dealer and we will finance 100% financing for you to get a brand new car at your pleasure, whatever you want to order, and that agency will, uh, will provide it. So they're looking at it and they think, gee, 
I get a brand new car and they deduct the payment from my paycheck and I still have enough money to pay the rent and uh, to, to go out with my friends a little bit. So uh, they do it and they, uh, and she did that. And then she could hardly wait to drive back in her new car with her new clothes uh, to the small town in Nebraska she was from and show off all of her friends how she had made it and things were going well and to show her parents. So she did that. And then she came back and as luck would have it, within four or five months, one of the roommates she had left, for what reason I don't recall, but the rent, they had to share the rent, so instead of one-sixth, she had one-fifth of the rent, and then somebody else left, so she had to pay one-fourth of the rent, and she couldn't afford that and her car payment and the other obligations she had, uh, including the beauty appointments so that she would maintain her professional appearance. and so. What she did was she finagled the, uh, uh, the the computers where she was working as a teller to show a payment had been made on her car when it hadn't been. And she did that four or five times and it was picked up by the bank and she was indicted. Federally? Federal, federal indictment for bank fraud and theft from a bank and all this stuff. She gets a public defender and they drop everything except one count and they they bring her into court. And it came up for sentencing. Uh, the courtroom was filled with her relatives and friends. And she's at counsel table. And I, I already knew before anything else had happened, I'd looked at the pre-sentence report. I was going to, she had no record of any kind. I was going to give her probation. And the bank had showed up for the plea of guilty, but didn't even show up for the sentencing. No representative of the bank was there. And I was going to issue an order that to the extent she could afford it, she would make restitution payments, but uh, there wasn't anybody from the bank there. So anyway, I knew I was gonna give her probation. And so I said, well, this cause comes up for sentencing and you hear first from the prosecutor and the prosecutor didn't have anything to say he knew pretty much it was going to be a probation. And the uh, defense attorney stood up and, oh, what a wonderful person, and the usual sort of cate catechism that defense lawyers give about their client. And then I said, and I'd like to hear from the uh, defendant. And she stood up at the lectern, and she was a, a nice, you know, nice young woman, and she was dressed in her best, and, and she was shaking. And uh, I started in. Before you did this, people trusted you, your parents trusted you, your, everybody else did, your employer did, and now you can never work for a bank again and you have committed this crime and you've shown you're not trustworthy. And I really went into it. And she's just standing there frozen. And uh, and I said, well, I'm going to give you probation for three years of probation. And she starts in crying and thank me and her parents get up and come and act like I'm Jesus or something, you know, thank you judge, oh, you're so kind, thank you so much and all this. And I looked down and she, this young lady had urinated on the courtroom floor. And I, I declared a recess and I went back into my chambers and I, I hit the wall with my fist. Lucky I didn't break my fist. I, really upset and I was just so ashamed of what I had done and I swore I would never ever do that again that anybody who was sentenced is a human being and the mere fact that they are being punished is all that need be said a judge doesn't need to to to, to add anything to it and I uh, I have never done that again but I there's hardly a case that I have that I don't think about what a jackass I was. When you prepare to do a sentencing and when, when you actually have to sentence someone, uh, what, what are the critical factors that you weigh? It depends on the case, because they're all different. But the, the analysis of the individual defendant is, I, I would say, the primary factor. Uh, 
uh, and that could be mean a lot of things. Uh, we discussed uh, Jimmy Bresnahan, and he was a, uh, no question about it, a battered child, and how he got to that point. And you think about what can be done psychiatrically to help somebody that's that's there, so that they they don't continue with their life of misery. A lot of these people uh, are. Uh, involved with drugs, habituated, or uh, sometimes uh, uh, e e even uh, addicted. And uh, so you look at that, you look at what can be done to, to help them, and at the same time, you, I, I look to see there, some of them are psychopaths, some of them are just antisocial, uh, some of them, society needs to be protected from them. Not nearly as many uh, in that category as there are in the category that are never gonna harm anybody but shouldn't be going to prison to protect the public because they, they just don't. We have more people in prison now than should be there. But those that, that are a threat, those that are dangerous, uh, like we mentioned yesterday, Mr. O'Driscoll, you want to make sure society is totally protected. And so you look at the, the mental status to me and the background, the psychiatric, psychological history. I look at the economic uh, vitality. If somebody has had a job and they've worked and they know how to get up in the morning and go to work and they know it's a paycheck and they know enough to have a, a bank account and, and to pay their bills, uh, they're, they're a step ahead of the one that dropped out of school in the sixth grade, joined a gang and cannot add, much less read, and have a bank account and so on. So you have to look and see what can we do given the abilities and the talent of the people that are in, in front of you. And uh, uh, th there's another uh, certain categories of crime that attract people uh, that, that have a, a very high incidence of recidivism. Uh, for instance, uh, embezzlers uh, have a very high incidence of this. Uh, and they, they know they're clever, they know how to cover up, they hide uh, what they've stolen, they take it from other people with no qualms at all. And uh, they do not receive in our system, in my view, the degree of punishment that they should because these damn guidelines set it up as, oh, well, there was no gun involved. Oh, there's no prior conviction involved. Oh, they, they have an income anyway. Oh, they have a college education. They're the ones I think need more time, not the one that never had a chance. So th that's another thing that, that I look at. Uh, I look at statistics and what the guidelines say, but for the most part, I find that there are just a, a lot of uh, uh, mindless uh, construction of numbers that have no qualitative uh, character to them at all. So I, I look to see from my own experience sentencing people, and I uh, sometimes let that uh, have an effect. One of the things that I listen to lawyers, and uh, Recently, by recent I mean within the last two or three years, we've started getting lawyers who pay attention to sentencing. Uh, in the past, they didn't spend that much time on it, and the things they said were this, virtually the same, like a catalog for every kind of case. But we're getting lawyers paying attention now and making filing written sentencing statements that go into detail. One of the, the best examples of that I can think of was our federal public defender, Jenny Grady, and she had a case involving a, uh, a former guard at uh, the Federal Correctional Institute who was charged with uh, uh, possession and distribution of child pornography. And she went to the experts in that field, she filed written reports, I think I did a sort of an estimate. She had over 200 pages of documents in her pre-sentencing statement she gave me about, about this man. 
one of the other things about him is that he was on dialysis and needed a, a kidney replacement. And she pointed out the lack of facilities the Federal Bureau of Prisons had and what could be done by having him in home confinement rather than in, in prison. But she, that's the one I remember the most. Well, one other, uh, another lawyer who I'm very, very fond of, uh, was in the public defender's office, and you know her quite well, is uh, uh, Kate uh, St Stimson. Stimson. This is what she did on a case that shows you the differences that happen. She was in then in the public defender's office, and her client was uh, a uh, uh, Hispanic American from the San Luis Valley. Uh, the San Luis Valley has Spanish-speaking people that have been there since before the Mayflower, so I, they're not all Mexican. That's what I'm trying to point out. But this guy was a Hispanic from the San Luis Valley and from a little tiny village right on the border between Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, and, and it's a, an area that I'm somewhat familiar with. So uh, at any rate, uh, he was a, in Vietnam and he was injured. And when he came back to his village, he couldn't farm anymore because of his injury. So he had taken this barn right on the outskirts of town and had remodeled it so that he could repair farm machinery, tractors, reapers, and all these other gadgets that farmers use, plus doing some automobile repair uh, uh, as well. And he was running that and living in the town. And some of his buddies from his service in Vietnam had gone into the uh, marijuana business and were bringing marijuana from Mexico up to uh, Denver for use, sale, and, and uh, transfer to other places like Chicago. So they wanted to have a place where they could exchange their big truck full of marijuana to smaller vehicles for further distribution. And they came and asked him, he said, can we use your garage? And he said, sure. And they paid him, not a lot, but they, you know, hundred bucks or something each time they do it. Well, the Drug Enforcement Administration caught on to this and they arrested everybody and they charged this guy because he was part of the conspiracy. He had no record, uh, uh, no criminal record, but this is what he had done. So he pled guilty and Kate Stimson got into her SUV with an air mattress and she drove all the way from Denver down to the New Mexico border to this little town and she took her video camera with her and she videotaped the town. She interviewed the deputy sheriff who lived there. She interviewed the guy that ran the filling station, general store, post office, other people in the town and had people that are saying, including the deputy sheriff, you know, he's a good guy. He helps everybody. There's no reason for him to go to prison. We can help him and he won't be in trouble anymore. And she presented, she, I don't know how many hours she had of this, but she condensed it down to about a 25 minute film. And I got that for sentencing in lieu of the usual sort of uh, junk that you hear. And I put him on probation, but it was one of the best jobs I've ever seen. Since that time, we've had lawyers in the public defender's office and the criminal justice act who have started filing sentencing statements and going into detail with their their clients and who they are and what's the uh, the ripple effect of, of having committed a crime and been caught. So are, that helps. Are you seeing more sentencing videos and do you find them effective? Absolutely. And, uh, and if, even if it's not in a video, I find it very effective to have it in writing that they have a sentencing statement. Uh, it's it's so different from what used to take place is that the, the lawyer would stand up and say something and you'd look at the client and the next case that he had, he's saying essentially the same thing. And so that's changed. There's been an individuation process that's taken place. I think, pure supposition on my part, but from my experience, I think it's because more women are practicing law today.
and they've looked at these things and they're communicating something that male lawyers never never did before. Now I'm getting male lawyers that are paying attention to sentencing statements. But I really think it's because of women getting into the law that that's happened. I, I was on a sentencing panel um, in California two or three years ago and we were talking about sentencing videos and, and there was a male federal judge who said that he routinely discounts them because he thinks that uh, he's being essentially treated to a Hollywood product. Um, and my, my, my sense was that he didn't really want to see the human being uh, in, the, in that well, person's environment. You know, I can say this, I've never been to Hollywood, I have no intention of going, but I have been on the Colorado New Mexico border and I'm familiar with that village and I know damn good and well that what I saw related to that, that it wasn't some con construct like that. I, uh, I know I hear statements from the lawyers or that, that say judges say things like that, but that, 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 let me give you another insight into this. I have a real soft spot in my heart for bank robbers. I just, I just do. And is, is this a Bonnie and Clyde kind of a perfection? No, the, these are people, they come in and they are just so dumb that you wonder how they tie their shoes in the morning. But they come in and I had one of them, he just stood up and he says, Judge, this ain't no who done it, I done it. Just don't hit me hard. And they feel just as comfortable going to prison as they do out. They just do their time, they don't complain, they don't file writs, they don't, they're just that sort of, that's just the way they are. And I had another one, uh, and I tell this to people and they think that I was snorting coke when I tell them. This is a true story. On a Rapaho Road, or County Line Road, there were three little small branch banks uh, in shopping centers, shopettes or something, in these little banks. And this guy goes into one with, with his own car and uh, with a license plate on it, and he has a, a rubber uh, uh, Bozo the Clown mask, kind of total rubber thing with the red fringe for the ball, you know, and he, he puts this mask on and he goes in and he hands him a note with misspelled words that he wants money and the uh, uh, the teller gives him, I, I, I don't even remember what, but eight or nine hundred dollars with a packet in it to explode when he leaves. And so he leaves and he gets in the car and she of course tells the manager and they call the sheriff's office and the sheriff's officer reporting to the crime and he goes down to the next one and he, he does the same thing with his Bozo the Clown and he gets the money and he gets in his car and he's driving down the street and a deputy sheriff pulls him over and the, he says, his question is, how did you know it was me? And the deputy sheriff said, you forgot to take your mask off. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, how can you get angry with somebody that's just that dumb? And so, and then I had one other bank robber who uh, gave the note to the teller and it was written on a deposit slip from his uh, girlfriend's bank account. And by the time he got back to her house, the police were waiting for him and he said, how did you know it was me? I mean, they, they just had no concept of what they're doing. And so, you know, I, they sentence and get time, but it's pretty hard to be upset by somebody like that. And then I'll tell them, I'll say, well, you had a gun. And they'll say, oh, I never would have used that. I don't want to hurt anybody. You look at their record, and they never have hurt anybody. They're not violent people, but there are other bank robbers are. But I mean, that particular genre of bank robber is one of my favorites. They, they just, they have an expression they, they say all the time to me, Judge, if you can't do the time, don't commit the crime. They say that to they you? They say that to me. And they say, but just don't hit me too hard. That's another thing. But so. one, of, uh, one of the things that you really dislike uh, is uh, a practice among lawyers that uh, consists basically of, of filing nuisance suits yeah. to collect fees. And you've written on that subject uh, several times. And one case I'd like to ask you about uh, is a case called Wright Haven, R-I-G-H, 
Wolfe, H-A-V-E-N, versus Wolf. Uh, can uh, you discuss that a little bit? Sure. Uh, and, I, and I hasten to point out that uh, you, you said I dislike these, and I do, and uh, I have perhaps a, a romantic uh, notion in my head, but I still think of the law as an honorable profession. And when lawyers dishonor it, I, I'm very angry about that. It, it upsets me considerably. I think in terms of the line in Henry V when uh, he's walk, walking around the, the field of battle before it begins, and he says that whoever, whosoever sheds blood with me is my brother, we are a band of brothers. I, I have that feeling of what lawyers as a profession should be like. And it's, it can be, and it usually is noble, and it's difficult work, and it's primarily a service for other people. And when that gets bypassed and becomes nothing but a matter of greed and avarice, then I, I, have, I have real problems dealing with lawyers like that. I think they're contemptible. So to go to this case, as I've mentioned earlier, when I came back from uh, my year off as a, as, as a senior judge, and I started taking cases from others, in addition to the lengthy complex ones, there's also uh, cases that, that can be processed together uh, because they involve at least one party is the same, the same issue of law. Uh, the best example of that is our court once handled uh, over 500 trespass on federal property cases with a protest that took place at Rocky Flats. And Judge Winter divided up the thing with his own whimsical sense of humor. And uh, we, tried, we tried these cases in groups of 20 or 25. But there's also, uh, a time when some lawyers will do a dump and they'll file uh, a whole bunch of cases at once. I have right now uh, recently assigned to me uh, 35 uh, cases against a company that uh, manufactures and uh, administers uh, uh, dialysis and these are all different employment suits around the country and we've consolidated, not for trial, but pre-trial. And I'm handling with a magistrate, we're handling all of these cases at once. Well, the one that you mentioned was similar to that. There were, I think, 33, 34 cases. And these two uh, lawyers in uh, Las Vegas went to uh, newspapers and they said, we want you to assign your copyright to us and we will sue anybody under the Copyright Act that violates your copyright. Uh, and there's a statutory penalty, I think it's $1,000 per violation, so you don't even have to prove the damages. And they, so the newspaper said, well, we're not assigning our copyrights to everything. So then they said, well, what we'll do is this, you only assign the right to sue, but all other decisions you retain. And we will be the holder of the, the copyright, but you retain all the rights, and then we will sue these people. And so they, they dumped them uh, here in our court. And the clerk, deputy clerks get these cases, and they just sort of, you know, this one, this one, and somebody looked and said, gee, these are all by the same plaintiff, and notified the, uh, their boss, the supervisor, who notifies the chief judge and they said, well, we ought to do something with these. And I said, put them all together and uh, I will take all of these cases and handle them. So the discovery is the same, the motions are gonna be the same, they're all form pleading, et cetera. But the defendants are different, so we may have to try them differently, but we'll process them and get them going. So uh, they came in and I looked at it and the very first case, uh, what was based on this, the, was the TSA, Transportation Security Administration at the airport? Yes. They, a post photographer, Denver post photographer, had photographed a guard who was 
giving a pat down search to someone and it was it was very humorous, let's just put it that way. It looked like he was, he was doing more than simply a pat-down search. And so it got in the Denver Post, and a copyright, because it was a Post photograph. And there's this kid in uh, Longmont, Colorado, who was, uh, I think, 19 or 20, and he was, uh, trying to think of the name of the, the, the term for it, uh, he, he, he couldn't communicate. Uh, the, what's the... Dyslexia? No, dyslexia can't read. This one is, uh, uh, gee whiz, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, autistic. Yes. He was autistic. And so the only thing he could do, he, he didn't go to school, he couldn't work, he lived in the basement of his parents' home, and he was on the computer. And his autism did not affect his ability to communicate on the computer. So he sees this photograph, and it's very funny, and he thinks it's funny, so he sends it out to some other people, and they sue him for violation of the copyright. And These Las Vegas lawyers sued him? These Las Vegas lawyers. So they had the family, the, guy, the kid gets sued, they were an ordinary, law-abiding family with a handicapped son. And they had a, a lawyer uh, who was local, and he was a general practitioner. I had never heard of him before. He had never been in the federal courts, he told me. In fact, he didn't do very much trial work at all, uh, court work at all. But he, he represented people in this town. And they went to see him, and he was going to refer it to somebody he knew that handled federal cases. But he looked at it and saw what they had done, and it made him so damn mad that he filed a motion uh, to dismiss the case in, in front of me. Now, the grounds he had in the motion were not really that strong, but I got the case, and I looked at it, and I looked at all these others, and I, it just made me so angry when I saw what they were doing. So uh, I, I set it down for oral argument, and these two mutts in Las Vegas wanted to uh, handle it by phone, and I frequently do that, but I wasn't gonna do it with them. They, so I made, this guy comes out, and he's very pompous, and we have these cases in our company, and they own the company, the two lawyers did, and they were going to sue and get $1,000, and then they would pay the Denver Post so much money for that, and then go on with all these different lawsuits. And so uh, the, the lawyer, I said, I'm going to rule on your motion to dismiss. And I turned to the other side and I said, you better file a brief. Well, we, we think we're on very solid ground and so on and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I want a brief. And I just make it work. So they, they filed a brief and it wasn't worth a damn. And uh, I told the Longmont lawyer representing his kid that he didn't need to file a reply. And then I wrote an opinion and my opinion was not based on the motion. My opinion was based on the essence of what copyright law is and that you cannot simply transfer a shows in action, a right to sue, and retain all the artistic benefits that the purpose of copyright law is to protect the artist and there was no protection here and therefore it was invalid. And I assessed attorney's fees against them and uh, within very short order they dismissed those other 33 cases. Your, your ruling that they didn't have standing uh, That's right. was considered to be pretty novel and contrary to a lot of other circuits. It was. And, uh, uh, has your ruling essentially swept the land and been adopted yes. by other circuits? There are no more of these people that I know of around the country that are trying to take assignments of copyright and sue for the damages and leave the copyrights with the, uh, the creator. As far as I know, it's been put to rest. Um, another case you handled that uh, I was involved in uh, involves sort of not the flip side, but uh, an another face of avarice, and that's uh, a case that took about 13 years to resolve uh, in your court. Uh, Colorado University Foundation versus 
American, American cyanamid. Yes. Uh, and you, you, you've told me that you, you thought that that was, uh, that case had public significance beyond just the lawyers wrangling and the jurisprudence. Oh, Can sure. you explain that? Yeah. Uh, you did a good job, by the way. <laughs> uh, After 13 years, thank you. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the case involved this. There was a, a vitamin called Materna that was produced by American Cyanamid. And Materna was a prenatal vitamin, meaning that it was to be taken by uh, pregnant women and uh, to keep them from, uh, to be well nourished, et cetera. And also it contained iron uh, in the uh, vitamin because uh, pregnant women have a difficulty if there's an iron shortage in their blood supply, it can lead to serious problems with with the uh, infant uh, phenol ketonuria or something like that, but it's iron's essential for pregnant women, and so this uh, vitamin was out produced by cyanamid. And as all these pharmaceutical companies have what they call detail men, and they go around to different doctors' offices and give them free samples and say ours is the best medicine. Please prescribe this and so on. So a rival company was going around with their detail men saying, uh, we've done tests and the iron in the materna vitamin is not being absorbed by women. So even though it's in the ingredients, it's not, it's not doing its purpose and it's just being eliminated by, by the uh, patient. So take our vitamin instead. And materna noticed a, uh, a down, uh, downswing in their uh, sales of the Materna vitamin, and they asked their detail men, and the detail men reported, and then there were advertisements by this rival company uh, showing that this iron was not being absorbed. So uh, Cyanamid had this, this guy in charge of their research who would hire scientists at different locations to do contract research for them. And he contacted uh, uh, the Colorado Medical School at the Anschutz Center, and there were two uh, physician scientists there uh, who did uh, hematology and said, we've got this, would you test our vitamin and see if we're not getting the iron absorption? So they did the tests and they got paid for them and they reported and they said, well, you're not getting the absorption that, uh, rate that women should have, but neither is the rival company. None of you, none of these with prenatal vitamins are actually providing women with the iron nourishment they need. So this guy says, thank you very much. And they put on an, uh, an advertisement that we have scientific tests from this independent research blah 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 that shows that our absorption rate is no different than any other. And so the two doctors are there and they're concerned about what's going on and they contact them again and they said, well, we think that we can do something with research to improve the absorption rate. And this guy running the cyanamid says, we're not interested, we got what we wanted. So the doctors on their own dime start doing further research and they come out with a discovery as to how to improve iron absorption in prenatal vitamins for expectant mothers. And so they notify American Cyanamid. They say, look, we found this out and here's what it is. And American Cyanamid has this huge public advertising called uh, the new Materna. And they advertise this brand new formulation and say, and it does improve the absorption rates and so on. And so uh, they, uh, the doctors think, well, they've done what they can and they don't get any more money for it because they've done this on their own dime, but they were actually pretty happy that they'd come out with this discovery that was going to be useful. So uh, I, I'm vague on the details now, but it happened a long time ago, but at some point, the uh, 
two things happened. Uh, one of the inventors came out, uh, went out to San Francisco to attend a, uh, a conference of some kind, and somebody out there told him that that Materno had gotten a patent on their invention, and uh, his comment at the time was, uh, "We've been," and I can't remember the exact word, but you know, we, we've been bamboozled or something. And so uh, it wasn't bamboozled; it was a less acceptable word than that. But whatever it was, he said, "You know, they've been screwed." So it was a four-letter word. So he comes back to and he tells his co-inventor, and they get, they, they, American Cyanamid says they want to test their product, and they, they send it to him, but the guy that heads the research had taken labels and covered up the commercial label, which showed the patent pending, or patent granted. So they're just looking at it and with a label on it that says for laboratory use only, and they have no notice, that's what happened. They did that, and then the guy goes out to San Francisco and finds out. So they come back and they open up the labels and they see this and they, they sue. And uh, uh, this uh, head of uh, research for Cyanamid had taken credit for the invention and had received a uh, cash bonus from American Cyanamid for his great invention. And as I, best I recall, I think they the trial showed he'd done the same kind of thing and stolen other items in, in the past as well. But uh, the, the doctors were suing, but so was the American or University of Colorado Foundation, which had provided money for the research projects, et cetera, and part of their agreement doing research was some money went to them. And then some of it went to the university itself. And in my order, I awarded the damages and then uh, I awarded punitive damages, but I said, it's the doctors whose careers have been damaged. It's the doctors whose integrity has been affronted, and it, the punitive damages go to the doctors, not to the university. So uh, that was uh, that case. But that, that guy was totally disgusting. And, and it took 13 years and several appeals yeah. <laughs> to reach that resolution. Well, it's, it's exactly right, and that's what you're talking about with you know, the death of the jury trial. Why should it have taken that long? But it did. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, flip back to a subject that we've sort of woven in and out of, uh, and that is your writing uh, mm -hmm. and uh, how prolific you've been. One of the things that you've done that a lot of judges, many judges, if not most, avoid uh, is some deliberately humorous writings, uh, and, uh, and I want to talk about a couple of the, the cases that uh, that gained you some favorable notoriety. Uh, from okay. People like columnist George Will and, and others. Uh, and I got an award from the <laughs> University of Wisconsin English Department for one of them, too. Uh, talk talk a, a little bit in generality about uh, why you <coughs> Uh, why many other judges choose not to use humor on occasion, and then we'll talk about well, some of the specific cases. Uh, first of all, I think you have to have a sense of humor, and some people don't. Uh, so, you know, if somebody majors in accounting and finance and then comes to law school and studies corporations, there's not a whole lot of giggles involved in that. And, uh, so maybe they don't recognize funny situations, or maybe they just, they're not interested. But I, this is hard work, and you, you work and you're dealing with, with human suffering and with uh, the success or failure of uh, business enterprises. And uh, you, you can get depressed if you don't try to look at things uh, more philosophically. And every now and then, uh, some case comes in and it's just so totally absurd that you say, I can't let this go by. I've got to point out that not everything we do around here is of the utmost seriousness. And so uh, 
I think the case you're referring to with George Will is a perfect example that the, the lawyer that did this, uh, I, I, had a, uh, I, I had a very friendly, I didn't know him that well, but I liked him a lot. He was ebullient and he was always cheerful and so forth. And so he was a Hispanic guy who had mainly a, a criminal practice and not much of a commercial one, but he was always just doing things and, and I enjoyed having him around or when he when he come into court. So he he had this client uh, named Maestas, and Maestas was a, a young Hispanic guy that was uh, working and playing softball, and uh, his ambition was uh, eventually to become a Denver police officer. And so Maestas was on the softball team with some other guy, and they they go to a bar and. The other guy starts teasing Maestas about wanting to be a cop and why would you want to be a cop and all this sort of thing. And so they get into a fight in the bar and they've had too much to drink. And uh, the bartender uh, basically just grabs them by the scruff of the neck and takes them and throws them out into the parking lot. And they continue their fight in the parking lot. And while this other guy is down, Mace just jumps on top of him and he bites his ears and his nose off. Both ears? Both ears and his nose. So uh, then the cops are called and Maestas is arrested and, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Maestas, it was the other guy and that did this. They call the cops and they send him to, uh, to prison and this other guy has uh, a house I, I'm getting confused. Now, Mestas had the homeowner's insurance. He had the homeowner's insurance. He was the guy that did the biting. That's right. right. And so the other guy, the victim, goes to see this lawyer, and the lawyer looks at it and says, well, you know, neither one of these mutts have any money. They can't even afford the beer that they were drinking. And so if I sue, what do I get from it? And then he goes, aha, the light goes on. He says, he says Mestas owns a home. So he checks and he sees that the guy has a homeowner's liability uh, policy. So then he decides, well, liability insurance policies cover negligence, but they don't cover intentional torts, intentional wrongs. So he, he prepares a complaint and files it in the state court, and he alleges that Maestas has negligently bitten the ears and nose off of this other guy. And so West American Insurance Company owns the insurance policy and they look at this and they file an action in the federal court, which is assigned to me, West American Insurance versus Maces. And they file a motion to dismiss. And they want a, what's called a declaratory judgment simply to declare that they are not obligated to, uh, to defend this case and go through this whole thing. And I look at it and I think, you know, sure, it's sad the guy lost his ears and nose and you got to take that seriously, but this is funny. I mean, this is really funny. That, so I wrote this opinion and I poked a little fun at the lawyer because I said, uh, I said, I'm going to fashion a brand new rule of law and that's three bites do not a negligence case make. You may have been able to bite the guy's ear off negligently but you can't bite both ears and his nose. It takes three bites, and that's not negligence. So I granted the declaratory judgment for the insurance company, but I just had a whole lot of fun writing it. <coughs> and the lawyer who represented Macy's came in, and he says, I didn't think I'd get away with it, but what the hell, you try. <laughs> so, but that was uh, a lot of fun. And George Will somehow or other got a hold of that case and he wrote back and he said, did that really happen? Somebody bit the nose and ears on somebody else? And I said, it certainly did. That's the case. And, and I quote from it, um, quote, I think the third bite pretty clearly elevates the activity to an intentional tort, however mindless it might seem, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. But you see, Dealing with all these other cases, prisoners' rights, Ramos versus Lamb, the stolen patents, and 
predatory lawyers dealing with copyright, and then all of a sudden you get something like this. And you know, so what? The insurance company has to come in and, and spend a few bucks to get out of the case. But I looked at that and I thought, I'm never going to forget this in my life. I don't want anybody else to forget it either. So an, an, another humorous opinion, which won you an award, uh, is called Tuggle versus John Evans, who was the uh, the uh, Warden of the Colorado State yeah. Penitentiary. That's a case um, you decided in 1978. Uh, tell us about that one. Well, 78 I was my first year as a judge. And as I said, I got a whole lot of these prisoner pro se cases assigned to me as the new kid on the block. So we're going through them, and you're seeing things that were in Ramos versus Lamb. And, people being beaten up, not getting adequate medical care, uh, suicide rate higher than the national average, uh, uh, self-mutilation rates very high, all this kind of stuff. It's very serious business and the prisons were, the pris prisons were, were not doing a good job, state prisons. Out of all these, after I get a certified class action, then Mr. Tuggle, who is a resident at this Colorado State Reformatory in Buena Vista, files his pro se action, and my clerk brings it in and says, you won't believe this. This guy is saying that the Civil Rights Act, Section 1983, was violated by the state of Colorado because when he's going through the cafeteria line and he's delivered his bowl of soup, there's a hair in the soup. And so he wants damages for cruel and unusual punishment because there was a hair in the soup. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, we got people dying, all these other things going on, and this jackass is worried about a hair in the soup. So I, I said to myself, I wonder what William F. Buckley Jr. would do with this case. And uh, so I went to my dictionary and every time I could find a word I'd look in the dictionary to find a more complicated, arcane, uh, unusual word to substitute for it. And I wrote this opinion as I thought William F. Buckley would review an evening at an unpleasant restaurant. <laughs> and so that's, that's how I wrote that opinion. But it, it was mainly just, you know, you, we, we don't really have enough time to, to deal with somebody who gets a hair in their suit. And I think one of the things I said in there was the only difference between him and somebody in a public restaurant who gets hair in their soup is that they have to pay for it. His was free. <laughs> so. you, you also said, and I quote, uh, <laughs> I'm not called upon to give a, a Michelin rating, rating to the cuisine at the State Reformatory, <laughs> yeah, unquote. Right. <laughs> um, as I recall, you won some, uh, some humor, humorous writing awards for that, and you sent it to William F. Buckley. Did right. you yeah. Hear back from Mr. I Buckley. did. He wrote back, and he he liked it. He a good chortle, is I think the word he used, and he he said splendid job. Uh, and and the other the award I got is not a real award, but I I really treasure it. The English department at the University of Wisconsin, and I think in Madison, but I'm not. I just don't recall specifically. But every year, they would look around at various things that have been written. And, and give awards, and they'd be awards like for the dumbest opening statement in a novel or for these different things. And so somebody found this opinion, and they said, the rarest thing is a humorous judicial opinion, so let's give him an award. And so they gave me an, uh, their University of Wisconsin award for the most humorous judicial opinion of the year. A, a third one that, uh, that attracted a lot of public notice for its humor uh, involves our own Denver Bears, which was a minor league uh -huh. baseball team before we acquired the Colorado Rockies. It's right. a 1984 opinion you wrote in a case called King versus Burris. Uh -huh. uh, what was that case about and why did you resort to humor to decide it? Well, it was about baseball and this the, the manager of uh, the Colorado Rockies had gone to a meeting with these other minor league uh, teams and uh, the way they schedule where they're going to be is critical for the finances of, of these uh, 
uh, minor league teams. So they, they want to say, well, we're going to play three days in Wichita, and then we'll go down to Oklahoma City, and that's close, and we can do our three games there. So they try and route it rather than the major leagues that fly anywhere and everywhere and don't care about the, the cost. But uh, uh, Mr. Burris was representing, uh, was the manager for the, uh, the minor league team here, uh, the Bears, if I remember, wasn't it? Was that yeah, the, Denver, Denver Bears. Denver Bears. And so there was a guy named King who was the uh, equivalent role manager or something in Wichita. In the Wichita Arrows. And so he, they're at this meeting and they make an agreement that they're going to schedule the games so that Burris can get his team to Wichita and then on to some close by, I think, Oklahoma. And then when they have the meeting, King uh, engages in what Judge Winter used to refer to as retro activity. He went back on his word and he uh, didn't do it. And, and uh, Burris just went berserk. He was, it, the, the meeting took place in Florida. And if you've seen baseball and you know that the manager comes out and swears at the umpire and keeps going till finally the umpire rips off his mask and points and sends him to the locker room and the guy stomps off and does that. And the fans boo. And you also know in baseball that the catcher's there and as soon as the hitter comes up, he says something to get the hitter all distracted, you know, like, something about, you know, who your wife's sleeping with right now or something, and they'll do something to jar the other side. And baseball's filled with that. It's also filled with great, wonderful quotations from people like Yogi Berra. And so I like baseball, and I, and I saw this, and I thought, what a ridiculous thing this is. And what was the lawsuit about, and why was it federal? Intentional infliction of mental suffering, because he had called him, among other things, a fag, and he, Burris called Burris called King of King Fag, of fag. And, uh, as well as all these other things that called him. But that was the one that stuck in King's head that he was humiliated and he despised uh, gay people, homosexuals. He said in his plea, and he just couldn't stand that. So, so I looked at it and I thought, you know, this is this is really dumb. And so legally, I did not see it as intentional infliction of mental suffering. And Practically speaking, I thought it's about baseball, and I, I need to I need to relax. And so I wrote the opinion as though I was describing baseball. And for instance, I said, uh, in, I think it says in there something about uh, the uh, the cases or the complaint is dismissed with without prejudice. And I put a footnote and said, or as Yogi Berra would say, the game ain't over until it's over. And I just, each time I said something, I used a quotation from, from baseball in it. And uh, baseball fans around the country, somebody that has a baseball magazine got a hold of it and printed it. Uh, I got, I, I think I got more mail on that opinion than any other one I ever wrote. One, one, of, the, uh, one of the claims is that King made against Burris is that um, Burris had threatened him with a spray bottle. He hadn't hit him or anything, but he had yeah. somehow He's shaken a Sprite bottle yeah. in his face. And you, you noted uh, that uh, the complaint was unclear as to whether Burris' intended delivery was overhand, sidearm, or submarine style. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful, wonderful baseball metaphor. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. But you know, why do you write a humorous opinion? Because first of all, because you can. And secondly, because occasionally the facts warrant it, and thirdly, it's mental relief from the stress of doing other stuff. Did any of these cases get appealed? No. No, not a one of them. Give you some sense of, <laughs> of their substance yeah. <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I want to kind of pivot to some, some more philosophical okay. questions. Um, and uh, one, one has to do um, with law clerks. Uh, yeah. you, you have hired law clerks since you 
been a federal judge right. starting in 1978. Um, and uh, some, some of your hires, many of your hires have been pretty unique. Uh, what, what is your philosophy sort of writ large in terms of the kinds of law clerks that uh, you want to hire? Um, and uh, how have you gone about that? Premise one is I don't take anybody else's word for evaluating somebody. I do it myself. Uh, premise two is that I don't have any confidence at all in the standard orthodox way that uh, law clerks are uh, uh, manufactured through the law school, uh, law firm, uh, courts hiring system. And uh, so I just don't do them that way. Uh, the, the typical sort of thing that happens is that somebody goes to law school, they want to become a uh, law clerk, the law schools pride themselves on how many of their graduates they can get to these coveted positions. Uh, the lowest one being the district court, then the court of appeals, then the Supreme Court. And what happens frequently is that a circuit judge will hire somebody as a law clerk and they spend a year or two with that circuit judge and then that circuit judge recommends them for appointment as a law clerk uh, to the Supreme Court. Well, it's a pyramid because, you know, people that are offered district court clerkships, uh, there are more of them, there are more district courts. And then people are offered court of appeals clerkships but there's only one Supreme Court, so there's nine of them, and I, I think they, I don't know the exact number, but I think each of them is, they could probably have as many as they want, but I think they, some of them have four or five clerks. Well, that's less than 50 of all the lawyers graduating in the United States, so it's a very coveted position, and many of them uh, that get that far, uh, when they graduate, Many of them will go into academic law and become professors and instructors. Uh, Justice Ide, Allison Ide on the Tenth Circuit started after having been a Supreme Court clerk. She taught law at CU Law School and then went to the Colorado Supreme Court and then to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. She, she had been, I, I can't recall, but I think it was Justice Thomas. She was a clerk for him. But that's not an unusual thing to do. Uh, Justice Gorsuch got out of uh, law school and got a doctorate as well at uh, Oxford and then he, uh, I don't know if he clerked in the Court of Appeals or not, but he clerked first for uh, uh, Justice Kennedy and then, or for Justice White and then for Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court. And then he took a position, a very high level uh, antitrust position with the Department of Justice. Then he went into private practice and then he was appointed to the Tenth Circuit and from there to the Supreme Court. So that's a path that is fairly typical. Uh, but I, I don't, I, I'm not interested in the necessarily who has the highest grades in the class. Uh, we're dealing with cases and I want to know how people think and feel about the cases they have. That's what I'm most concerned about. Another thing is that uh, the, the process itself uh, places great emphasis on faculty, law school faculty recommendations and on writing samples. And the problems with those uh, that I see are twofold. One, if you don't know who the professor is, what difference does it make what that professor says? I mean, you might be dealing with Timothy Leary on the law school faculty or Oliver Wendell Holmes, but if you don't know who that person is, what difference does it make what that recommendation is? The second thing is that when it uh, comes to their writing sample, it's not theirs. They, they may have drafted it, and then it's gone to their legal writing uh, professor, or maybe to a professor of some subject that the thing's about, and then it goes usually through a law, law review editing process. And by the time you get it, it's been processed so much that there's nothing there that necessarily reflects the author, the, the, the student. So I don't use those. I just don't, 
why do it? So here's the thing. As with my Luddite attitude, there is a, uh, a national uh, bureaucratic plan to take care of the problems involving hiring law clerks. The law schools want it all done at once. Uh, the judges all want it done at once. The law students are caught betwixt and between, and they can apply for different positions, and they may get an offer, but they want to go somewhere else, and they haven't heard from that particular judge yet. So they put together this, this plan, and it's got some sort of an acronym uh, I don't recall what it is, but they set up a deadline as to when law students must apply. And then they have a suggested form with the letters of reference or writing sample and what kind of information should go into the application. And that all goes in at a certain deadline and then it goes to the judges that have been designated by the law student. And then the judges have until a certain day, September 12, let's say, that they're supposed to make a decision but not say anything to anybody until that date so that the student isn't whipsawed by having an offer from one and wanting to hear from another one and then gets the one that makes the offer says, well, you've got 24 hours to decide. And so they, they wanted to stop that kind of practice and they wanted to stop the law professors wanted to have it all done at the same time so they could write their letters of reference all at once and not be uh, plagued by having to do it uh, upon request. So uh, the fact is that the appellate judges, some of them, did not honor this program. And they went ahead and made their offers to students ahead of time. And they always wanted the number one in Harvard, the number one in Yale, the number one in Columbia, and going for these prestige law schools with somebody with super grades. And I think I'm pretty sure about this, that the reason is because they've got tie-ins with certain justices and they want to get that person and have them there so that then they go to the Supreme Court and then that circuit judge can say, oh, my former clerk was a clerk on the Supreme Court, et cetera. It also helps the Supreme Court clerk to get a judgeship on the circuit court later. So that friendship and stone permeates the process. Uh, district judges, they apply. A lot of times it's the location. You get a lot of applications here from somebody that's, that's at Ohio State University and likes to ski. Uh, they don't get through too well on the application process when they say things like that, but there is that. Then there's the local law schools. People have their homes and things, and many of them want that job because they know it's an entree to a local law firm that they're interested in. And then there are those from other places that, that come here uh, because they're interested in the kind of law that they're going to get, or they apply to a different state because they, they think they want to be there and if they're a law clerk, they can get associated with the legal community and then apply for a job with a law firm there that they wouldn't otherwise have any connection with. So there are a lot of motivations to become a, a law clerk. Uh, I don't want to be a part of that process, and I'm not. So what I do is I, first of all, I have an internship program, and during the academic year from September to the end of May, I take students from either University of Colorado or the University of Denver, uh, and they work here as uh, interns. We give them assignments, they work with my law clerks, they work with me, we get acquainted with them, we see what they're doing and so forth, and from that cadre of interns, there sometimes are people that that we would like to be made a, a clerk. They get a law school credit for being your intern? Yes, it's a pass-fail uh, course, and they, they, they agree to so many hours, and then the law school calls and say, well, what do they do? And I say, well, uh, she drafted a, a, an order on summary judgment, and I can send the, the draft and my final copy if you want to see what was done. But they did a good job, and they also got to watch jury trials, and they got to do other things here. And, as long as they're exposed and they get some training, uh, the law schools give them credit. 
Uh, so I do that. Well, in the summer months, there are students from all over the United States uh, who couldn't be interns because of the academic year. So we, we confine our selection of summer clerks to people from different law schools. And I've had them from virtually all over. Do, One of do other, law, other judges here do that? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think they do the summer thing. I think I know that some of them do internships with uh, either University of Denver or the University of Colorado, but I don't know if they do what I do for the summer or not. But I have a law clerk now who's a Vanderbilt graduate, and uh, uh, she she worked as an intern uh, here before she graduated from law school. And I, I had a vacancy, and I thought she was super. In fact, the law clerk that she replaced was leaving, and uh, I, I think he got married and was moving to Portland. <laughs> and, and he said, well, what about her? And I said, great, I already knew her. I didn't have to do anything. But I do that. The other thing is, I don't look at law school grades uh, beyond a, a certain basic level. I mean, if, if it's a four-point system and I've got a student applicant with a 3.2 GPA and another one with a 3.4, I'm certainly not going to hire the one with the 3.4 because of that point and a half spread. Uh, I've had one of my law clerks was absolutely marvelous, but I didn't hire him for this reason. But he graduated from Harvard Law School, uh, and uh, uh, with, he was summa cum laude. And, and he, he is utterly brilliant, but that's not why I hired him. It, it certainly didn't hurt him, but that wasn't the, he could have gone to any one of these circuits. Why did you hire him? I hired him because uh, I liked him, because he had gone to uh, Princeton to undergraduate school, and he had written his undergraduate honors thesis on uh, a history, a diplomatic history of the relations between Great Britain and the Iroquois nations, and they had published it at Princeton. And I thought, this guy is an undergraduate, writes a book, and it's published by Princeton. And so I read it, and he could write, and I liked the fact that he had a different interest. Uh, he also uh, was a, uh, uh, a harrier, a long distance runner, and uh, he played French horn. And the other thing, the critical factor, is that whenever anybody applies like this, and I narrow it down, I write to them and I say, I don't want a law review article or a case note, and I don't want a term paper. I want something that you wrote as an undergraduate, or I want you to answer this question. Why do you want to work for me and why should I want you to work for me? And it's amazing the differences that you get. But what you're looking for is, if they answer that question is, I looked you up, I read your opinions, I know what you're doing and I know your jurisprudence and I like it. You know, and I want to be part of that. Rather than somebody that, that says, well, I got you know, a 92 percent GPA and I was number three in my class and, and I uh, wrote these articles and here's a letter from the dean who I've never met telling me how wonderful the guy is. Well, what? I don't care about that. When you first became a federal judge in 1978, there were very few women who were, who were members of the That's legal right. profession. Um, your first two clerks were women. That's right. Uh, was that a conscious decision? Yes, definitely was. And who were they, and how did they turn out? The, the first one uh, was, uh, her, her name is, uh, she's still a good friend, uh, Debbie Whitman, and she uh, went to uh, the University of Denver, and she, uh, her undergraduate major was in finance, and her, then she went to the law school, and she was a first-rate student, but I, I don't know what her grades were, I don't recall, but she was, you know, she did a good job, but she also worked her way through school, and she worked her way through school at a clothing store selling primarily, interestingly enough, suits to 13-year-old boys who were about to make their bar mitzvah. <laughs> so <laughs> she, she did that kind of a thing, and uh, the, the other thing is when I, when I interviewed her, 
she was extraordinarily positive and near ebullient about the opportunities that this provided. And she didn't come in here saying, oh, I know all about this. She said, oh, what a great opportunity to learn. I don't know anything about federal practice. What should I do? And it was that kind of enthusiasm, plus reading and knowing that she could write. And also, I have to say this in all candor, I'd never handled any securities law cases as a lawyer, and I knew I was going to have them here. And she had done securities work and had a degree in finance, so I knew that I could have her teach me while she was here. And so that was, and she was, she still is, delightfully daffy and brilliant as can be. And so it was great to have her. Uh, the other was a, a young woman from uh, the University of California at Berkeley, Bolt Hall, and she had gone, she was uh, a Chicana from uh, Southern California, and she had gone to uh, undergraduate school at one of the University of California campuses, Bakersfield or someplace like that, and she had majored in library science, and she was very into the whole system of libraries and filing systems and, and that sort of thing. Plus she was bilingual and I wanted to have that. And uh, she, uh, there, there, weren't, there weren't any women and there weren't anywhere near any, there were no Latinos or Latinas here. So I hired her on that basis and uh, she was great. She was terrific. And uh, she was married to a young associate lawyer at uh, Sherman Howard, so we had to declare conflict on anything they they had. But uh, uh, she she was terrific, and uh, uh, eventually she left here. And she uh, that was before Reagan had killed legal aid, national, whatever it was called. And she worked just down the street in a one of those national legal aid offices. Legal Services Corporation, yes. and, and she did that, and then she eventually moved out to back to California. But she uh, she was terrific. So and then the other thing that happened right after that, uh, I I had uh, I I think the second one that came in was uh, uh, Ken Scott, and uh, uh, the guy that came in with him was, uh, I think it was Carlos Rodriguez, but at any rate, no it wasn't, I can't remember who it was with Ken. At any rate, what happened is that uh, uh, there weren't any African Americans. And I went to Judge Winter and I said, why aren't there any African American law clerks around here? He says, oh, you can't find them. He says, the ones that are any good, the firms are just grabbing right away and uh, we can't get any good ones so we don't get them. So I had a friend of mine who's a lawyer uh, and a professor at NYU, uh, a very famous uh, law professor named Tony Amsterdam. And I, uh, I called him on the phone and I said, uh, do you have any African Americans that might be interested in coming out to Denver, Colorado and being a law clerk for me? And his response was, how many do you want? <laughs> and so the next two I hired were from NYU, uh, African Americans, and they worked here, uh, and then I had uh, a couple more from NYU. Uh, one of them was a Colombian named Carlos Rodriguez. And, uh, from, from the country of Colombia? From the country of Colombia, yeah. His father was a UN official or something in New York, and he, he, was, he was Hollywood star handsome. And my secretary used to get calls from all these women wanting to talk to him on the phone. And, she used to she used to cuss like a trooper, and she'd say, "God damn it, Carlos, get your own phone." So we didn't have cell phones, you know, so, so. But that was funny. But he was good. But I also enjoyed him because uh, he would come in after a weekend, and he would have tears in his eyes, and he would be walking down. He'd say, "I'm so in love, and she doesn't love me. She's moved away." And he was broken-hearted and so on, and the next day he'd find another girl and he was okay. So it's fun to watch him. But he was serious. He, uh, NYU is an excellent law school, and they were really good that came out of there. So. 
One of your notable law clerks uh, came from an Irish law school, That's right, which, which is College. not not a traditional law clerk hire. Uh, tell us about him. When I went to uh, uh, senior status and I was gone for a year with apnea, uh, I, uh, no, let's see, let's see, no, that's not how it happened. I'm sorry, that, I have to back up. Before then, I'd been in Ireland and I had uh, met, uh, a they, they don't call him professors, he was a lecturer at uh, Trinity Law School, a guy named Jared Hogan, and I met him through somebody from Denver who introduced us, and uh, I said, you know, we, we can take any law clerk from any country in the world that's a common law country, so Ireland, England, Australia, Canada, anywhere, and I said, I'd like to have a, an Irish clerk, and uh, so he said, well, let me see what I can find, and I left and came back, and then I got this application, and uh, uh, Brian Murray was his name, and he said he's one of our best students and he's very interested in doing this. And so he came over and uh, uh, Trinity College has a, a, a prize, they, the History Award, and it has nothing to do with history. It's the best speaker that, that they, they have and it's a competition and he won the History Award a highly prestigious thing in, at Trinity College. And he was graduated with, with honors. So he came over here and, uh, and he worked for me for two years. And uh, then uh, he, he went back to Ireland and uh, I, I got sick with the apnea and I had written to him and explained what was going on and he wrote to me and he says, well, if you feel up to it, why don't you come here? Because it was at the same time the Court of Human Rights was, was growing in its influence in Strasbourg and applying human rights decisions to uh, European uh, community countries, including Ireland. And then he had the Irish Supreme Court and they, they were in a spot because it had formerly been part of uh, the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom doesn't have a written constitution, so they had looked, the Irish Supreme Court, to American precedents to interpret the Irish constitution. It made perfect sense, but they, it was Ireland, and uh, it was in, during the troubles with Northern Ireland, and so they had uh, real problems trying to decide how they were going to handle such things as freedom of religion. They had compulsory Catholic education and all these other things going on that the Court of Human Rights wouldn't tolerate. They had the abortion issue, which in those days was totally prohibited in Ireland. And so they, their law school was very interested in the development of American civil rights doctrines, particularly regarding freedom of religion. So he says, why don't you come over and talk about that with our students? So I was given an honorary uh, lectureship at uh, Trinity College for a term, and I prepared a series of lectures and gave those while I was there, and then uh, uh, came back to the United States and went to work. But Brian Murray was the guy who had uh, arranged that for me, and I just heard uh, from a mutual friend uh, just yesterday that uh, he is now regarded as one of the top barristers in Ireland and uh, looks to be slated eventually for the uh, Supreme Court of Ireland. And he was a full-time law clerk and he were was, you in Denver, Colorado for uh, two years? He was here and he was he was great. He was funny too. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, you had a South African law clerk as well, didn't he you? He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, and I got her from uh, Justice Erickson on the Colorado Supreme Court called and he said that he had received a, a call from a friend of his who was at uh, the Lewis and Roca firm in Phoenix and there was a, uh, a woman from South Africa with a master's degree from uh, uh, the London School of Economics and uh, 
she had been in uh, Phoenix, her husband was a uh, specialist in uh, intensive care medicine and he was coming to Denver. She had applied to him through this friend of Erickson's who incidentally, the friend had been a clerk of the US Supreme Court. So, but anyway, Erickson didn't have room and he called me and he said, I think you would like this person. And, uh, he said, uh, she's, she's going to be here. Would you talk with her? And I said, sure. And she came over and in addition to everything else, she was an expert in immigration law. And we had a, quite a bit of that at that time. But uh, anyway, I, I read some of her stuff and I interviewed her and liked her. So she came to work as a law clerk for me and she was here for about two years. And then her husband uh, received an appointment to be head of uh, intensive medicine at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, so they moved and I had to hire somebody else. And uh, then she, he, he became and is now the dean of the medical school at Wake Forest and she is there uh, on the law school faculty and one of her colleagues is another former clerk of mine who's a professor and assistant dean at uh, Wake Forest. Uh, Tim Davis? Tim Davis, yeah. And he was one of your law clerks? Yes, yeah. Um, and He's a nationally recognized authority on sports law. I've got a couple of his books here that he's written, yeah. Uh, you've been critical and uh, were critical in a 2015 article, uh, actually a speech you gave called Swan Song. Mm -hmm. You've been critical of the, the contemporary uh, law school way of teaching and uh, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on that, especially in the context of the kinds of law clerks that uh, you look for. Yeah, uh, well, the, 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 I'm looking for precisely the kind of law clerk that was not ruined by a law school. <laughs> and that's sort of the, the test. Uh, this is, the, I, I think it's been a problem with law schools since, since their very beginning since Christopher Columbus Langdell at Harvard set up the case method system. It's been a, a very bad way to, to learn law. And in addition to that, with cybernation coming into play and the sentencing guidelines, our method of thinking has uh, been uh, dominated by uh, uh, quantitative rather than qualitative analysis. And it's what I talked about earlier about one case is one case, no matter if it takes 20 years or 10 minutes, statistic. And we do that with sentencing and you try to put people in pigeonholes and disregard the unique characteristics uh, of them. And I think pretty much the same thing has affected law schools. They've become overly concerned with uh, computers and with quantitative kinds of things with artificial intelligence and uh, when you add to that that when the law schools academic law schools began in the uh, latter part of the 19th century uh, the, the heaviest influence was a, a, a philosophic school called positivism in which it's a denial of natural law, that there are certain inherent rights that people have, and positive law is, the, if you consider the word deposit in a bank, is what it's posit, meaning to place. And so the idea of positive law is that law has no uh, extrinsic value, it's only what the law is. It's neither good nor bad, it's just the law. And there's a, there's a spot, but it's, much smaller than is used, but a very tiny spot in legal education where new uh, people studying law for the first time need to understand that you have to think objectively and not subjectively. And so uh, positive law is a way of expressing things without any extrinsic values. So you don't say in law school, well, I feel it should be this way, or that isn't right, that's not justice. The law school professors pounded into you. What does the law say? What is the, what is the black letter of law? And you learn to analyze 
in those sense in that way, and you lose, uh, you learn to analyze it in what what are referred to in philosophy as categorical uh, classifications, rather than emanations and uh, intuition and so forth. So that's one of the problems. The other is that law schools teach courses without teaching history. In order to, if you're going to be a lawyer and try to help a client see where they're going to go in the future, you have to know what's happened in the past. You can't tell the future without knowing the past. But gradually, over the years, history has just become ignored in legal education. And there are law schools where they don't even offer a course in jurisprudence, much less it be a required course. There, uh, of course, uh, I've taught legal history at both law schools, and uh, uh, it's an elective. So they, they are not regarding the law as a liberal art. And part of that was Langdell's theory that law was science. Now, I could go on about him and how nuts he was, but the, the real reason he did that is because the law school wasn't recognized by the rest of Harvard University and he wanted his professors and teachers to receive the same uh, status that the physics professors and the botanists did. So he came out with this idiotic statement that the law was a science, just as much a science uh, lawyer uh, in the library is just as much a scientist as the botanist in, in, the, uh, in the nursery or the physicist with his telescope. You know, that's crazy. It's not. It's, a, it's a, not a, even a social science. How has that affected the legal profession today? Well, I, I think what it, I, I, I see this all the time, of lawyers coming into court and they cannot explain how this particular problem fits into the entire area of jurisprudence. They can't trace its development. They just say, this is the majority rule, and if you don't rule this way, you're going to be reversed, or that kind of stuff. It's kind of the interim approach that they do. But they they don't they don't recognize the organicity of law that it's a growth that it that it has a relationship to other uh, disciplines principally philosophy and, and law and essentially is applied philosophy but they don't know that uh, let, let me give you another example when I as a freshman at, DU Law School, I don't know if I told you this or not, but uh, the professor, another law student said, uh, uh, what is the law in Colorado on this point? And the professor said, I don't know and I can prove it. And as soon as he said that, I thought, my God, this is freshman epistemology. I, I took this four years ago, this is easy. And so you prove what you know and what you don't know. Well, history plays a part of that human aspects. It's like that thing I told you, that shameful thing with the, the young girl where I just followed what other people had done and humiliated her the way that I did. Uh, because I was not thinking. I was not treating her as a human being. And I, I think that's this problem that we have that permeates our society today, that qualitative analysis is just simply rarely if ever done. There's an excellent uh, professor at the University of Chicago, Martha Nussbaum, who's written upon this uh, subject in great, great detail. And, uh, you know, you hear people talk about what's the law of animal rights, and nine, 99 out of 100 lawyers will say that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Why in the world would you do that? Well, if you read Nussbaum, you can understand why. Because what is the value of judgment, and where does it apply, and why should it not apply in other areas? Now that doesn't mean that you know Seabiscuit files a tort action in the district court, but there there are reasons why we have to consider uh, endangered species, you know, the suffering of animals that are uh, kept on farms, the uh, uh, puppy factories that exist all of these other things, there's a whole area of human failing that the law doesn't pay that much attention to. Health officials do, but not the law. So 
Nussbaum writes about that among other things. There's a an idea that uh, is overused to uh, to the point of absurdity is uh, and, and it has been so since uh, shortly after World War II of a uh, American economy based upon the ideas of Adam Smith and utilitarianism, the, the greatest good for the greatest number, uh, that, that sort of thing, and it, it relates to the, uh, to the worship of free enterprise and the, the free market. And these are all myths. They're ideas which are serious and need to be studied, but they are not the sum total of our knowledge. And yet they become a, almost a religious orthodoxy. That you have to say the free market. If you don't, you're a socialist. If you're a socialist, you're bad. Well, socialism is another myth, a construct. And it, the fact of the matter is, you can look at our society and see a lot of socialism. Nobody complains about it. But the minute you use the term socialist, they do. And the same thing is true as free market. Free market doesn't make something right. It's frequently a license to engage in chicanery. So, are there model law schools? They don't teach that, that in law school. Are there model law schools that uh, uh, you you think uh, point in a more positive direction? I'm, I'm not an authority on that subject, but frankly, I every law school I have any idea about is in great need of revision and, re and uh, improvement. You think clinical uh, programs at law schools uh, um, have improved since you and I walked that path? I think, I think that clinical training is excellent, an excellent experience for a law student to have. I do not think that clinical legal education as it is presently run is excellent by any means. And I think there are reasons for that. One reason is that the, uh, the so-called doctrinal faculty, that is the, uh, the tenured professors of contracts towards property, uh, etc., looked down upon cl clinical training it was uh, considered inferior, and the people who were hired uh, to become clinical uh, instructors were not on the, originally they, they weren't on the tenure track, and they weren't hired or paid the same. And what, what happened to a great extent is a lot of these people were uh, people who had worked in public defender's office or a legal aid society or uh, perhaps a prosecutor or city attorney's office and they kind of burned out and they had some experience and they, not much, but they had it and so they, they got jobs running these legal clinics and so you had, uh, uh, and the other cadre of people were retired, I know, I knew of uh, more than a few who were uh, retired uh, JAG officers from the Army or the Air Force that uh, became clinical professors. They, they did not have the uh, uh, they, they didn't have the uh, uh, serious academic achievements to become part of the doctrinal faculty, but they knew enough about organization, etc to, uh, to do it. But I don't think that, uh, let, let me put it this way, I, I, don't, I don't think that clinical legal education comes anywhere near the value or the quality of medical clinical education. I think that physicians and medical educators have truly refined this to the point that it, it, it's splinted. Now, cost is obviously a big problem but that's never stopped the medical profession from doing anything. So I don't know. Uh, but I, th I, I, I like the idea. I, when I was a freshman at DU Law School, 
they had something called uh, justice court practice. And you could go over to the justice court and be assigned a case and try it. But I never had a faculty member watch me or give me pointers or anything like that. You just tried the case and watched other lawyers do something and sort of acted like Charlie McCarthy to their Edgar Bergen. And uh, it wasn't much, but I wanted to be in court. So. Uh, we've been going at it for another two hours and 15 minutes. Uh -huh. uh, it's probably time to stop. Um, had enough of me for a while. Well, can you do one more morning? I can, sure. Um, I'm, I, th I think, uh, I, I don't think I know we can get this done tomorrow morning.